Hi everyone, hope you're well today. Welcome back to Four Heads, where each episode we talk about a contemporary business topic with some experts from business and academia. And this week we're going to be discussing a very, very hot subject of the digital skills gap. And to do that today, I am delighted to introduce this panel of geniuses and experts in this area. So, so first up is Rob King. Rob, hi, and can you tell everybody about yourself, please? So, so clearly the geniuses and experts are the other two panelists, and then there's me. Um, <laughs> But, um, but I've, uh, I've been involved in RPA now for, um, for about uh, seven years. And, um, and over the last seven years, one of the things I've seen is um, just how, how it's developed, you know, how it's become more mainstream. But actually, I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that's really sort of struck me, um, particularly in recent, you know, recent months, has been um, obviously the advances of the, uh, the skills gap and the challenges there. Um, in fact, I, you know, I, I got myself so immersed into this topic that um, I even wrote a book. So, quick plug there, uh, called Digital Digital Workforce, um, which was really all about trying to help organisations actually get started with automation. It was all about, you know, this is what it is, this is what it can do. Don't be scared of it. This is the jargon. You know, don't, it, it's it's something. There is something there for everybody. Um, and really, that's 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 really been my focus has been helping organisations to to get started and understand what 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 automation can do. Um, you know, I, I do use a term. I do use a term RPA, but I think it's more than RPA. It, it, it's the whole gamut of different yeah. tools. The whole. I'm sure Ed will talk about ecosystems later. Um, but I think that's you know that's that's really what it is. It's 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 the whole the whole package. Um, and over the last you know over the last sort of few years, I've been very fortunate or misfortunate for them um, to work with both of these guys. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess I'll I'll hand over. Fantastic. Thank you, Rob. Great introduction. We'll definitely post some content about RPA below for anyone that's uh, not, not familiar with it. So thank you for that. So hi, Will. Thanks for joining us. Tell us about yourself. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. I think, uh, yeah, I, I run Bloom Search. We're a, we're a digital transformation skills based headhunting business. Uh, we're based in Milton Keynes. We've been going for the last uh, five years or so. And over the last few years, we've seen um, dramatic shifts in trends around hiring specifically into kind of innovative innovative tech next gen technology which includes some of those areas that, that Rob spoke about around automation or business process automation intelligent automation as well as things like data science machine learning AI you know all of those other kind of fun areas to, to discuss so you know I think from a, a hiring perspective hopefully I'm able to give some insight into uh, into what people are looking at um, you know, and Rob and Ed probably more on the, on the technical side. Great stuff. Oh, well, thank you very much, Will. And then last and definitely not least, Ed, or Edward, should I perhaps call you? Sorry, to tell us about yourself. Yeah, so it's funny. Um, so my, my background, you know, accountancy, you know, consultancy, outsourcing. And, you, you know, you saw RPA coming on the scene maybe like four years ago. And you thought, well, this is just a no-brainer. What's the value add? You know, what can I can tell them? Everyone's just going to do this stuff. You know, it's simple. You know, why would you not do it? Um, but then you start to see organizations try to do it or talk about doing it and just hit roadblocks. So and then I, that's what kind of piqued my interest. But then you thought, well, hang on. You know, for the, for the options, you know, what's going to happen in the market? And from my side of things, you know, there were tons of opportunities in the consulting space. Um, there was loads in the technology space. But what, I, I just couldn't see anyone <clears throat> focusing on the skills gap. Um, you know, and I really, you know, I was in the RPA space, so the skills gap, you know, I was looking at was the RPA, but it could have been blockchain, it could have been AI, it could have been machine learning, it could have been anything at all, it could have been, you know, it, so basically in any sort of emerging technology, um, there's just there's just kind of the instant skills gap that happens because people just don't have, the, the, the demand's there, but the skills aren't there and the experience isn't there. Um, so, so it's kind of fascinating, you know, so the last couple of years, you're going to bit of a kind of a, a reassurance that actually I wasn't mad in the, in the, the, the issue, but just really struggling to see organizations, certainly a, a kind of a, a CEO level or a, a senior HR leadership level, they will realize this is, actually a, this is actually a business risk. Forget, you know, RPA, digital, blah, blah, blah. That, you know, for, for businesses, especially um, in a tight labor market, this is actually a business risk um, for survival, let alone kind of evolution. So I'll say more about that later. That's so interesting. Awesome. Well, uh, let's start with Rob then. So, I mean, it's, it's taking a step back and maybe just explaining kind of where you see the market right now. Obviously, you know, even in the introduction so far in the call, we've covered so many technical areas, so many technology types, so much opportunity for businesses, which is massively exciting, clearly. But 
but like just generally speaking across the board where, where do you sort of think the digital skills gap is at the moment and then, then like how does rpa become mm -hmm. a concept that the companies need to need to think about can you give us like a I don't know, like a summary in a minute of what's going on. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so yes, I think, um, you know, one of the things I do is I, I talk a lot of conferences and so you get to meet lots of different organisations. And um, so this topic, you know, the topic of skills and resources is a <clears throat> constant, constant theme. Um, so I guess that that's, that's the first thing. I guess the, the second is, I mean, you know, um, just this week, I mean, reading in the press this week, um, there was a quote from Michael Dell at, um, at a forum, um, a forum in Switzerland, I think it was. So it sounds like a, a, a bit of a good gig, um, but um, but he was talking that you know the most critical thing that, uh, that sort of faces organisations at the moment is the skills gap. Um, so you know there are a lot of organisations also sort of also struggling with that, and and I'm also going to throw in you know the, the the dreaded B word into this conversation. Um, that um, you know I think Brexit has a lot of impact on that you know because i think what what organizations are seeing i'm talking to is is a couple of things first um people are staying put they're not they're not moving around perhaps as much as they used to it'd be interesting you know if we we're seeing some of the same um just because you know there's a there's a lot of market uncertainty um in terms of what's what's going on particularly in the uk but i think it's probably probably true beyond the uk um and I think, you know, there's the organizations and businesses because there's just so much what the hell is Brexit um, are wondering where they're going to get some of these people from. They've, they've mm. they, you know, they've seen a very easy flow of, of resources, you know, across Europe. Um, and, you know, if that if that start to become sort of, um, you know, sort of hampered in any way um, in, within a few months, um, then. Um, then what are they going to do? So it's, it's, you know, it's a little, perhaps a little late, but it's, it's it really is running up the agenda really quickly. So a fascinating topic, I think. That's so interesting. And, and Will, from a kind of in-demand perspective, I think, I know a key challenge in this area for me as a kind of marketer and, you know, leading different companies is that I kind of want to do lots of cool stuff, but with this technology, I'm aware that it requires an entirely new skill set often, you know, it needs people who can stretch across <coughs> things, across digital technologies like you know ai and robotics and automation that you know were, were previously never in this discussion so so for yeah. us, it's like a headhunter like how, how how are companies approaching you about this are they coming like fully armed and aware of these issues or are they are they like increasingly not knowing what they even need if that makes yeah, I mean, sense yeah i mean there's probably a, a few different answers and a couple of different questions in there but i think that for me the main thing that the skills gap is it's multifaceted like we're talking about you know the skills gap of a company looking for you know a resource there's, there's also the individual human, you know, the individual candidate or person, you know, whoever that might be in terms of skilling themselves up. And I think we're pretty lucky, certainly, you know, in my generation where, um, you know, I grew up on YouTube and whatever else, anybody these days can skill themselves up, whether it's on SEO or, you know, digital marketing or social media or coding or, you know, there's a lot more, you know, these days to, to the skills gap than just what does the company need and where are the skills lacking? I think it's, you know, there's, there's an argument on both sides of the table that, you know, it's, it's the individual responsibility to, to take, take, take control of their kind of growth. And then also, yeah, we're talking about kind of where, where businesses are looking, businesses are lacking. Um, and can I, I, I really put it down to on both sides of the table, you know, something I'm very keen on, which is a growth mindset. You know, I think those businesses that are keen to innovate when it comes to processes, how they compete for talent, how they onboard talent, you know, how they pull people through and, in, you know, introduce them into the business, et cetera, is, uh, is a really interesting topic. Um, we're quite lucky that we, um, you know, don't cherry pick our clients to, to the nth degree, but we certainly look at does this business have that kind of process and that kind of growth mindset in place when it comes to actively working with them. You know, we work on both a contingent and a retained basis. So when we're, when we're only being paid when, when we're successful, that's something that's really important, I think. And, you know, is a business, do they have a culture that they're open to being coached, for example? Do they have a culture where, you know, they're open to being led by us in terms of what they can get at what price? You know, and then, you know, in, in the skills gap, you know, the individual skills, I think I personally feel like the skills gap is much more of a, you know, a legacy business kind of culture to, to hiring, onboarding, maybe even in some instances, some slight arrogance around, you know, what, what businesses expect from, from a candidate community. You know, we, we see it at the moment with, 
you know, certainly some big four consulting firms, you know, their, their process is you know, ridiculously slow in some instances, almost to the point of, without pointing fingers, almost to the point of arrogance. And, you know, you have some smaller startups or scale up businesses, they'll come along, they'll, you know, they'll care about the candidate they're looking to, looking to recruit, and they'll just snap people up inside of a week or two. And you'll have another business, you know, sat there kind of going, you know, give us two weeks to review some CVs and, all of a sudden, you know, and I think that's just basic economics, isn't it? Supply and demand at the moment, you know, there's, there's incredibly high, high, you know, high demand and not too much supply, um, which means that the good candidates are in incredible demand. You know, we're regularly seeing people kind of at a mid and junior level doubling their salaries in the RPA space just because they're in such high demand. They'll go from 25 to 45 or 50K overnight. Um, you know, so... The, the, it's, it's an interesting topic. It's uh, it's multifaceted, I think, and I, I I do believe in the the candidate side of the argu argument as well, or the job seeker and the individual person. You know, having a growth mindset and upskilling themselves. There's a hell of a lot you can do for free these days. Um, you know, when it when it comes to that side of the world, and I think you know one of my kind of one of my one of my biggest things around innovation is um, something that Steve Hansen the New Zealand um, you know, head of rugby rugby coach said um, fairly recently, and they've they, they've they've become you know if anybody else follows rugby, I'm getting kind of off tangent now, but they you know they have a real kind of growth mindset, and when it comes to um, innovating and building a team, they've built a winning team over the last 15 years that is you know has gone through multiple generations and multiple iterations, and there's a there's an underlying culture there of innovating when they're successful. I think Steve Hansen says something like when you're at your top of your game, change it. And I think there's very few businesses that are really adopting anything like that. I think, you know, um, you know, Ed mentioned kind of businesses just struggling to survive. And I think there's a few businesses out there, certainly that we've seen inside the last couple of years, they're getting to that kind of point of success and then they stop and they stop innovating. And then all of a sudden, two years later, some 24 year old from Silicon Valley's, you know, eating their lunch money. Um, <laughs> and they're, they're struggling to, to keep the doors open. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's multifaceted. I think, you know, the individual skills aren't necessarily in ultra, you know, low supply, but I think it's more of a business culture of hiring expectation process, etc., And kind of, you know, those kind of roadblocks are the main things that we're seeing. Okay. That's super fascinating. So, so I suppose, Ed, like building on that whole point around adopting a growth mindset, I'm sort of sensing that for some companies that might be <laughs> culturally quite hard to admit to themselves that they, they need to be open about learning and growing and trying things that they haven't done before. And I guess the kind of automation and, and robotics space, it must be the best example of this, right? It must be, or do you find a lot of companies are just kind of terrified about this technology or, or are they adopting that kind of growth mindset that will describes and like just admitting that but still wanting to learn and expand you know kind of what, what are you what are you seeing well um the, 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 yeah i mean it's very ready to start i think you know i mean we'll talk about big consultancies there you know you, you know it's the classic kind of cobbler's children you these guys go, these guys go out and advise their clients what to do and how to do it and be the best in the world but when you actually go back to their internal processes you know, which we'll see that kind of in the hiring front, they're pretty shoddy. So it's kind of hard to, um, but you know, from my, from my side of things, there's kind of a, there's so many different dynamics to this. Cause I mean, obviously Rob talked about um, Brexit, but you know, the, the we, we started off online and being online was just the best place to start because rather than saying we're going to start, at, you know, we're going to launch in, you know, Chicago, or we're going to launch in Berlin. You know, by by actually going through the statistics we were getting online, people coming to our website, you know, looking for RPA training, you could actually see where the hotspots were, mm -hmm. and it was very surprising. You know, so you know, you'd have thought you know London, New York, you know, um, you know maybe you know, a few other places, but you know, but in reality, the, the places that punch above their weight are Sydney, Toronto, certainly you know London is is way up there. But then you think, well, why why, why is it happening in these these real cities rather than you know, in, in Italy or Spain, if this is about cost cutting and, and, you know, getting rid of people, then you think, well, these kind of country, countries that are more in need of, you know, um, you know, you know, cost cutting and weren't, um, weren't really in a kind of a, an advanced stage. You think they'd be the ones that are gravitating towards, you know, these kind of cost cutting, get rid of people kind of models. But in reality, the adoption of RPA is, is completely 
eye-opening because it always ties in with very, very, very low unemployment levels. You know, so the UK had, you know, like multiple years, I think eight years of nonstop growth, you know, running out of people, Brexit compounds that. You go to Sydney, 20 years of nonstop growth, you know, um, you know, so basically running out of people. So you're left with this kind of option, you know, you know, there is no one to do the work. If you're going to find someone to do the work, you can be heavily overpaying for what they're doing. So along comes RPA as a solution to that. And, you know, the, that's why Toronto's adopting it fast because they've run out of people. Same for Sydney and same for, for London. So there's these kind of bigger issues going on. Um, but as individuals, it's fascinating because you can, what, what we, I mean, I don't know if you're seeing the same well, but we see a lot of people just taking a, an incremental step. They've got 95% of their skills already. They're adding RPA on top of that. And suddenly they're very, very employable in a whole new area. Um, so, the, so again, in organizations as well, I would probably guess that almost everyone we train in organizations for corporates around the world, they are upskilling their existing teams. They're not... Um, bringing in lots of new people. Certainly, they're definitely bringing in people in addition, but they're looking at upskilling their, te their teams. And the reason goes back to the macroeconomic picture is because they can't actually find them. They know if the people walk out the door, it's hard to find replacements and, you know, in Chicago and Toronto and Sydney. So they're choosing this kind of um, reskilling model to keep their people. And it's a lot cheaper than the cost of you know, going out and hiring Will to find a replacement for someone who's, uh, who's, um, who's walked out the door. But also it retains the knowledge and, you know, you end up in this kind of paradox is that everyone started off thinking that the robots are stealing our jobs. But in reality, the companies want to keep their people and you're almost left in this jobs for life yeah. model. Um, yeah. So it's an absolute paradoxical situation, but absolutely yeah. fascinating. <laughs> uh, it's still just happening. It is so interesting. And Rob, why do you, why do you think that kind of message around the positive, the positivity and the opportunity around this, why, why is that never talked about? Why, why do you think the headline around, you know, job loss and, you know, uncertainty seems to be what everyone talks about when, you know, if you just had to summarize the last part of this conversation, it, it just sounds nothing but exciting. You know, people learning new skills, you know, adopting a growth mindset, companies doing things they've never done before. You know, these, these, these all sound pretty good to me. So why, why, why the negative headlines, Rob, do you think? Because they're not reading my blog posts or my <laughs> blog posts. <laughs> they will now, they will now. Rob, but Rob, what do, you, what do you think about that? Why do you think it's, why is this such a negative topic often? Oh, you're on mute, Rob, sorry. Yes, yeah, I, I, I think this is fascinating because, I, I, you know, I think, um, it, and it's really different from country to country. Uh, that, that's the other thing that, that you notice is, um, you know, in the UK, I personally blame the Daily Mail for a lot, a whole lot of this. Um, you know, their headlines of, you know, um, 15 million jobs will be eliminated, you know. Um, I mean, Andy Haldane at the Bank of England uh, is responsible for a similar quote and, and it and i think you know in the popular popular press um or unpopular press um it does get that that negative you know that that negative sort of vibe and um and of course you know negativity probably sells newspapers and that's that's why they don't talk about all the positive mm -hmm. stories and and i think you know that's the biggest that's probably the biggest thing that's changed in the uk um since i started um you know sort of five seven years ago and um, when you talk about RPA back then, it was uh, it was always, you know, you were literally going through and explaining step by step exactly what it was. Now you've got to start with the, you know, the real sort of consideration to the people um, and what's going to happen, you know, with regards to their jobs. And and most of the time, you know, if not, you know, you know, sort of it is a really positive message. Those people who use RPA um, always come back saying how, you know, how it's changed their lives. It takes the robot out of yeah. the human. Um, but you don't get that, you know, that's not a worldwide thing. You know, we're, I've worked, you know, I've been lucky enough to work in, in Germany. I've been lucky enough to work in um, in the Netherlands. Um, and they haven't had that same degree of negative press. And so the starting point is very different. So I, I think our perspective in the UK is is slightly warped to to perhaps, you know, most of the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> I, I, bl I, blame the, I blame the Daily Mail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure if you could speak Dutch, you'd see the same things in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, but, but we speak, so we, I mean, we, we ran a course, you know, back in October, November, and, and the, the, the guy that was sponsoring us there said, said to the trainer, he said, look, you know, the, the, for the first half hour, 
you know, for after the first half hour, don't be afraid if half the, half the room leaves. Um, <laughs> that's because there's an extra 15 people coming to see what this is all about because there's such excitement in our company. The CEO is going to be there. The CIO is going to be there. Um, mm. There's such a buzz about this stuff. Everyone really wants to see what it's about. So don't be afraid if everyone walks out of the room. That's just because they didn't expect to be there in the first place. But there is a, we, we see a ton of excitement um, and energy around this. You go to conferences and it's super positive. Um, you know, and, and I think where, where I kind of, a lot of the blame is that you know the HR leaderships in these organizations need to see this as uh, uh, an employee retention strategy is it they need to address it head on they need to be energize their organization they need to again that growth mindset is absolutely fantastic um, as a concept but they need to say look this is this is just the way the world's going We're, we need you to stay with us because of all these macroeconomic reasons plus also you know our organization you can help us change better than a bunch of outsiders can ever do you know but that that message isn't getting drilled down i mean you just go to the, the cipd website or the shrm website and type in you know you know um, rpa or the automation or robotics there's almost nothing in terms of content and this should be them leading this charge because this is, again at the end of the day everyone gravitates to, to, to technology as the as you know how does it work what will it do but the rest of it is all people so that's so interesting and, and like, well in terms of like the candidate view on this i guess it's also must be quite confusing for the, this generation that's entering the market now because as you eloquently put earlier right they're they're entering fully armed on this topic they've trained themselves they you know, they've done coding courses they should have done hopefully yeah um but but yeah will do you also like tell us a bit more about that disconnect about the the new generation joining the workforce but then the people they're being employed by not seeing yeah. Well, understanding what's going on basically yeah. i mean i think it's a, go, going back to i mean I'll, I'll answer but i think just flipping back to what rob said around the the answer to uh, uh, is there a lot of scaremongering the jobs being lost and all this kind of stuff we we actually had in our last panel discussion this 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 question um rob, rob was there this question was asked by one of the audience members and the guys on the panel um were were running the automation practices for john lewis thomas cook and Aegeus. The three big chunky businesses doing things around automation that could potentially, you know, cost people full time employment and that kind of stuff. And they, they, each of them have been running automation programs of some kind or another for a combined, I think, 12 or 14 years combined. And not a single full time job had been lost to intelligent automation or robotic process automation. Um, so, yeah, I think I think like Rob said, there's a lot of scaremongering. It's either Piers Morgan or the Daily Mail or whatever, um, telling telling everybody that they're gonna they're gonna be losing their jobs in 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 a little while. But there was an interesting thing I read the other week on on that same subject that the <clears throat> World Economic Forum put out a report that said in 2020 they they suggested 33 percent of jobs in 2020 don't currently exist. Um, and it, you know, and it's even higher percentage of businesses now. You know, we're losing. You know, the, the life expectancy of a business these days is. I'm not sure what the statistics are, but you know, a hell of a lot shorter than it used to be. And I think that potentially kind of goes hand in hand with 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 that evolution of skills. But um, you know, we we, we uh, regularly have at least a couple of people every week, kind of from a development or engineering background or whatnot, kind of coming to us saying, "We've done some googling on this thing, RPA." Uh, you know which of the three, four major vendors do I need to get certified in for the best chance of a job? Um, <clears throat> and the answer, in all honesty, right now is any, you know, um, and any hands-on, any hands-on implementation will, you know, any hands-on project, um, you know, project role will, will suffice for the moment. Businesses are completely vendor agnostic at the moment. If you've got the experience of, you know, automating a business process with any tool whether it's UiPath or Blue Prism or AA or Autonomy or whatever you know that will be interesting to somebody the you know the skills adoption or the you know isn't quite there yet to the point where someone's saying no nope, you know so you know say with cloud for example now you know any any business might want a, a very specific type of Azure engineer with very specific background RPA and automation certainly isn't at that point yet you know we're we're viewing an experienced candidate if someone's got two to three years kind of hands-on development under their belt, then they're, they're a pretty experienced candidate for us. Um, so, you know, there's, there's still a long way to go. I think, you know, the, the HR blockers are occasionally there. Um, and like I said, you know, for us, it's all about partnering with, with clients that understand where those, where those blockers need to be addressed, whether it's in their, you know, interviewing process or whether it's in, 
how they present themselves and how they sell themselves as an opportunity in an organization. Um, you know, those roadblockers existed 10 years ago with the really kind of enterprise adoption of cloud and it exists today with the newer adoption of AI and machine learning and RPA. Um, you know, it's, it's always going to be a, there's always going to be very similar, similar roadblocks. Awesome. Can, I, can, I, can I ask a question? Well, from, because yeah. one, of, one of the things that we, we see a lot of is, um, you know, the, you know, the job request comes in and saying we're looking for someone with, you know, 35, 35 years blue prism experience. <laughs> and you go, well, okay, first of all, whoever's asking that question has got absolutely the wrong mindset. Secondly, they, yeah. they roll, when it comes to the job role, they're looking for someone that can do consultancy, process analysis, implementation, change management. And you go, hang on, you're asking a developer to do this. So there's that. But the, but the other, so it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the buyer of the of the resources doesn't really know the questions to ask, doesn't really know the, the job titles or the, the real work that's going to be done. So there's that. On the other hand, we've got candidates that are super, you know, they're 10 years .NET developer experience. They've done training. So they've got on paper everything they need, but they just don't have the experience part. Um, for my side of things, you know, we give, we, give, we give people support after they finish the training. So we can you know, glide them into the workplace with support in the background. So they're always... Um, 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 they're never kind of like on their own, but but we still see employers looking for that six year, six months experience. But in reality, the candidates got as much as they possibly can get in terms of background, training, yeah. knowledge, capabilities. They're proven in the workplace, um, but the employers are not taking that leap of faith. So they're almost happy to do nothing rather than pick a great candidate who's got the right motivation, the right background. Um, so how, how, how do you see a lot of clients dealing with that? a lot of your clients addressing that issue? I think, I think that's the same across the board. You know, we're in a, we're, you know, and, and that, that bridges all, all the skills that we work into. And, you know, for me, it comes down to we're, we're a solution led business. So we identify whether it's a need and we provide that, that, that solution. And I think what you're maybe hinting at is the need quite isn't, you know, isn't quite a big enough pain point yet in order to, um, you know, take a bit of a leap of faith, like you, you know, like you said, on on maybe someone that doesn't quite hit everything that you're looking for, or you know, finding that unicorn that is also several other things at the same time. But I think, you know, the for me, a job spec and a you know, a role brief or whatever you want to call it is is a bit of a wish list, you know. And yes, to the uneducated, they're going to be saying we're looking for 12 years of blue prison experience or you know, 14 years of UiPath experience and UiPath is what, three years old now as a business or whatever. Um, and you'll find someone that's kind of looking, looking for something like that. And for me, it's, it's more about, you know, what we do a lot of is, is where possible educating our clients as to what is possible. And, for, you know, I think one of the biggest areas right now is that perm versus contract kind of mentality. There's a lot of businesses out there that are you know, adamant we need perm this and we need perm that without realizing they're fishing in a very tight market because it's entirely contract dominated. And when any, um, you know, you see this across the board with all sorts of new technology adoption, um, you know, across recruitment, but, you know, at the very inception of a market, it's, you know, it's very, very contract led, then it becomes kind of perm and then it becomes contract led yeah. right at the end again, when kind of vendors stop supporting and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so for me, it's, it's also a contract be led, uh, you know, contract versus perm led, led argument as well. Um, you know, we try and educate our clients where possible. I was in with a client last night. They're a machine learning and sure tech business. And we were looking for engineers for them. You know, we were able to narrow that down to say, look, you have a, a, a 14 you know, percent better chance of finding a candidate if you're open to a contractor. And they have a huge pain point of one of their major customers not being able to deliver a project because they haven't had somebody start. So yeah, I think it comes down to client education, you know, and, and, and if, if there's a client out there that's kind of digging their heels and saying, no, nope, we absolutely need this, then, you know, you know, I can't pull a rabbit out of a hat and yeah, yeah. Thing, you, know, you can't make something out of nothing. Can you? Um, no, so yeah, it's about, it's about kind of education, I think, and just, just telling people what they can get for what and giving examples. That makes sense. I, and the, sorry, and the, and the experience gap, I, mean, I think the biggest gap we're finding is, you know, we can give the skills, we can give the background, we can give everything else, but we can't give experience. Have you seen anyone innovatively, innovatively address the experience gap? So, so Rob, maybe just uh, to conclude, with that, <coughs> obviously a lot of people watching this are going to be either already experienced in this space or potentially quite a lot of them are looking to get into it. 
learn a bit more about it or maybe you know look to see how their own company can adopt it so have you got like a kind of practical first step that you think people can take to sort of get into this whole kind of space that we've talked about today yes i you know i think you know the 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 skills gap is it to some degree it, it it's widening even further because i think when organizations can't find the resources themselves they they sometimes look for outsourcing opportunities but of course the outsourcers are finding it difficult to find the resources as well so it's it's it becomes a bit, it does become a bit of a vicious circle and i think the answer the answer is within our own control and it, and it is to be um to be able to sort of start to build some of these these skills up and, and invest the time and you know and the money that goes with it in actually sort of creating those skills internally and um you know i'm i'm, I'm my, my my profuse apologies i'll mention the book again but but you know that was part 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 of the, the the book was trying to just say look this is for everybody um and it's not difficult you know once you overcome the, the bit of the jargon um this is how you can go about doing it and build those build those skills up and the, the, there are sort of a few simple skills you can work you can put in start small and grow and i think that 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 is that that is the the, the mechanism by which organizations should should sort of jump in feet first the worst thing they can do is procrastinate and and there's there's a lot of organizations um mm -hmm. that are and continue to procrastinate and and that comes back to ed's comment about it's all about survival because you know all the time they're procrastinating all their nearest competitors probably are not right. um and, and then then it'll be too late that's so interesting well thank you for that robin and, and ed like any any builds on that do you sort of when people ask you like well, okay i get it it sounds important my company's under risk <laughs> you know i get it what what do you sort of say to them to do next once they've uh, once they've had that realization well, I mean, the, the answer to that is just do something because I think by, do, by doing something or anything, you, you're going to learn a lot more than thinking about what you should be doing when maybe you, you know, might do it sometime in the future. Just doing anything is going to be the, the, the best learning point for individuals or organizations. Um, so, yeah, that taking that micro first step is the most important thing and just doing, not talking. Um, but, but I think, you know, the, the bigger picture here is it doesn't matter whether you're an individual or an organization. I think it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about RPA or blockchain or anything. I mean, for any individual, an organization, the landscape of the workplace and what technology can do and how it does it and what it can deliver, it's going to change every year radically for the, everyone's, you know, for the rest of everyone's lifetime or career, certainly. So a lot, of the, a lot of the building blocks around that are actually, forget the technology, you need to learn how to learn. You need to realize that this is a not kind of do a course, move into a new job, and that's you for life. This is kind of a mindset which is absolutely iterative you know week by week month by month ongoing um and I, again it applies to, i don't really care which sector whether you're a heart surgeon or whether you're um you know um you know a, a mushroom farmer and you know ken you know i don't really this your te technology is going to be the constant change across our, and learning to deal with that and grab the opportunities and learning how to learn and again you, you can go wider into things but actually you've got to keep your brain fresh and sleep longer and lead a healthier life because to going to be receptive to these changes but so you can go a lot wider but in terms of being aware that this is not just do a course move on or change jobs and that's you done this is absolutely the mindset you need for the rest of your lives um and that's it's an exciting place to be an exciting mindset to have um but if you don't have that now then you know you're gonna have to learn that at some stage so again I grasp the initial now. <laughs> well, that sounds good. And I guess, well, last but not least, like any any kind of concluding thoughts or any sort of you know starting points for people you'd recommend if watch this video? Yeah, I, 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 I really, really passionately agree with Ed about um, you know people self educating and self learning and you know taking responsibility and accountability for their own success and their future. And I, you know, I'm I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, you know, that growth mindset. I think. You know, to couple that on the side of the business and, you know, uh, that, that side of the world, I really think it, it needs to start with that strategic vision. You know, that CEO, that business leader, whoever that is, they need to have a strategic vision. You know, they need to communicate that vision and then execute on it. And I think that will then filter down that, that kind of growth mindset to anybody throughout that organization. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and businesses are able to, to leverage technology these days far, far better than they used to be able to. And, uh, you know, businesses like YouTube or Instagram or whatever, if you, if you, there's some really interesting studies actually without getting into the, the nitty gritty details of it, but 
per employee compared to you know a Kodak or a Sony or whatever back in the day when they IPO looking at market caps and different you know things different businesses the the, the tech companies of today or, or what was 10 years ago per employee of you know astronomically more valuable per employee I think Kodak something like 240,000 per employee for their market cap whereas Instagram will be you know something like 77 million when they IPO'd or whatever <laughs> and, and that's just being able to leverage technology um, but yeah I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of the growth mindset on both sides of the table I think on the business side it starts with the leadership identifying a strategic plan a vision communicating it and then really simply just you know what most people struggle with is just executing it um, and for me on the hiring side that goes into um, <clears throat> you know the HR teams the internal talent acquisition teams whoever that might be you know, being up to speed with, yep, if you're going to engage with an industry expert like, you know, like us, being being open to being led by someone saying, look, you're just not going to get what you're looking for at that level. You need to do this. Or actually, you might be better off looking for just this. Um, and I think, you know, that kind of mindset and that kind of flexibility comes from comes from the top down, um, for me personally, anyway. Amazing. So can, I, can, I, can I just add one thing to that? Because I think, you know, that mindset top down, absolutely. But the top down you know, mindset is very important, but it's got to enable and it's got to foster and encourage you know, bottom up innovation. Because the guy at the top doesn't understand really how things work and can't see yeah. everything across every other. But he's got to have an environment where individuals can push forward new ideas, try new things out without risk, fear of, fear of you know, what can go wrong. Yeah. It's actually, you know, don't worry about the downside, let's look folks on the upsides. And that is a very, very difficult thing for especially larger organizations and more established organizations to do. Um, but that's the only way that people can be able to, at a micro, at a, kind of, at a functional level, really take advantage of all this, you know, incredible um, changes happening in every single field that we're talking about. Waiting for the top guy to kind of, you know, um, validate things, it's never going to happen. It's never going to fast yeah. enough. But just that sort of yeah. mindset you can, they, from top down, he or she creates from top down. That is the key thing, and and encourage, encourage risk. Yeah, <laughs> that's. I think that. The, the uh, sort of risk, you know, being risk averse is something that's often um, thrown at um, senior leaders. And, and I don't think it's true. I think, you know, often the senior leaders of organisations are you know, very open to risk. But actually, their, their message doesn't translate through all the levels through, you know, it's almost like the top of the organisation, the bottom of the organisation. You know, you've got people who are who, who will take those risks, who will, you know, who will actually sort of try new things. But actually, I think that the, the, the sticky bit is often the middle management layers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's very, very smart. Yeah. I always just say, go fast, go fast, take chances, you know. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, all, we're all in startups, so it's easy for us. Yeah. To <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, guys, I mean, I mean, seriously, I think, you know, definitely in terms of educating anyone who's watched this video, I think you've definitely motivated them to uh, adopt a growth mindset in this area and really get going. So thanks for supporting their, their learning as well. And I really appreciate you joining us today. I think there's been some incredible insights, loads of actionable stuff and, I'll make sure I'll post some content below to each of these guys' companies and what they're doing so you can follow up on it as well. <laughs> so so look, I think Rob, Ed, Will, really appreciate your time today. Thanks very much for attending. I uh, hope you enjoyed it today, everybody, as well. If you did, please make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already and do leave us a comment and let us know what you think. But thanks very much for joining us and we'll see you all next time. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks. Bye. Thank Bye. you.